what do you think it's holding him back? I think we knew we need new formats, you know. And when when I grew up, I mean, basically in Switzerland, as I told you, I started to make a lot of you know studio visits, and then I received a grant from the um, from the Cartier Foundation um, when I was. I had just done my kitchen show, you know, so it's very, my sort of whole approach was always very DIY, you know, I wasn't waiting to be invited to do a museum show. Anyway, nobody would have given me a museum, you know, at 22. And so I just did it in my kitchen. Recently, I was listening to a conversation that you had in a different, we have an interview or something like this. And you made a very interesting point that I was very curious. You said something that growing up in Zurich, being an only child, you almost force yourself to, to be always reaching out to people. There's very strong need to connect. Do you feel like that was more of a necessity because you needed to be around friends and meet people or was it just more part of a personality? It's just the way you were. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I was always driven, you know, by curiosity and uh, growing up in a, in a small town because I was born in Zurich, but I grew up in Weinfeld and it's a small town of 8,000 people in the eastern part of Switzerland, you know, it felt, uh, yeah, and being the, the the single child there and not having sisters and brothers when I grew up, you know, so it felt like in a way that, you know, a bit lonely. So I always had an urge to connect. That's true, yeah. So it was more like you really chasing that opportunity to be around people. You like being around people or you were more the kind of child that enjoy some quiet time. No, I was always, you know, my, my work grows out of conversations. My work is conversations and, you know, the conversations produce reality. So I think that was already the case when I was a child. I was always into conversations. So I think this is interesting. You said a conversation brings reality. Is there a point of view that you always had it with you? Or at what point did you realize in that by the time I'm having this conversation, I'm exchanging ideas, I can see and I can build a different reality? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, when I was a teenager, I started to look for my mentors, you know, so I started to visit a lot of artists. And uh, in a way, I became aware that, you know, I wasn't an artist, but I wanted to work with artists, right? So I was kind of wondering what could be my role. I was like 17 or something. And so... I met this Italian artist, Alighiero Boetti, and he, the late Alighiero Boetti, was an amazing artist. And he said, you know, there is all these artists who have unrealized projects which don't fit into any categories. You know, they I like projects which are outside the box. You know, I think we all have these projects, you know, which are somehow outside the box or maybe also outside the discipline we are in and so on. And he said it could be nice, you know, that you sort of are helpful to make these projects which society considers to be, you know, impossible you make them real, you know, you sort of help artists to, to, to realize their dream. And I thought that's, a, you know, that was sort of my first idea of my profession that I could be, you know, I have a profession where I would enable artists dream to become reality. So I would say from that moment onwards, you know, my conversations had to do with this idea of, um, of producing reality, if that makes sense, something like that. No, that completely makes sense. And that was at age 17, but how, but that's also lead a level of confidence when you're going out and talking to those artists and talking to those people and you have this idea, you have to present a level of confidence or so something to, to back up what you're trying to say, right? Everybody sometimes have great ideas, but you have to be able to execute it. At what point in life did you realize, you know what, this is, I got this. I can do this. This is not a problem for me. I would say, you know, the artists encouraged me to, to do exhibitions and produce reality. And so I would say it was more or less uh, when I was 20, you know, I, I started to kind of think I could experiment with exhibitions. And, you know, I think it's really important to have mentors, you know, people who encourage us because at the beginning is really scary to do things and to have a mentor on the side or mentors on the side who say it's all possible. They believe in you. I believe in this, in this idea of mentors, you know, that we have to find mentors. And that's an interesting thing. How do you find mentors? Back in the day, is very different than it is today. Right now, you can, you know, there's social media. There's so many ways we can reach out to people. But if people get innated with so much information. For you back then, were you just knocking on people's doors that you were interested to learn from and say, hey, listen, I'm eager, I'm motivated. And what can you teach me? What, what can you, you know, show me the way? Yeah, I, I mean, I would ring up uh, artists and say, you know, I would write them letters. It was obviously... It was the, the mid 80s, you know, so Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web in 1989. So we are, you know, in an analog age, it's pre-internet. <laughs> so it's by telephone. And I did a lot of, I just hand wrote letters to people and said, you know, I would love to meet them. And you're totally right. I mean, today it happens in a very different way. I mean, um, I was very good friends with Virgil Abloh, you know, and it was amazing how he mentored a lot of younger people whom he met, you know, via social media. 
No, for sure. Now, go, going back to the letters that you were writing back in, you know, in the mid-80s, how, how many of those letters did you hear back? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I basically um, very often also would go to openings and meet artists and, you know, uh, meet them there. So I was quite persistent in my, you know, if I wanted to meet someone, uh, I made several attempts. I tried by telephone or letter, or I went, you know, I went to an opening of an artist and would meet them there. So yeah, I was I was persistent. Yeah. Do you feel like this new generation that uh, the accessibility to artists and to curators like yourself is a lot easier than it used to be? A little bit uh, have an advantage in that aspect that they don't need to be. I mean, I guess they need to be as persistent as you were, but uh, to have their work being able to express their vision to you or to anybody else is a lot easier. Yeah, I think at the same time, you know, it's interesting that it's not so different. I mean, if I speak to young designers who tell me how they met Virgil, you know, I spoke to Samuel Ross the other day and he said he just, you know, started to send a couple of Insta messages to Virgil. And I mean, it's just a different medium, but it's kind of the same way. You just basically, when you begin, you know, you reach out to a mentor. And I suppose there's always been this idea that, you know, if somebody really wants to learn and wants to find out, you you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the beginning of, a, it's the beginning of a conversation, you know, so I don't think it's that different. It just happens through a different yeah. channel in a way, you know, I would say. Yeah. But now if you flip the coin, I'm sure you are someone these days that everybody wants to learn from. When people try and reach out to you, young designers or artists that want to get tips or at least start a conversation, you are a busy man. I mean, you have so many things to do at the same time. How do you manage that? And were you looking at those those first initial conversations that sparks interest in you to dedicate time to mentor those young generation? Yeah, no, thanks for this question. I mean, I think there are many different ways. You know, I mean, obviously, uh, teaching, you know, I used to be a professor in Venice at UF, you know, where we did a seminar with... Um, uh, actually, uh, Stefano Boeri, where we brought together art and architecture, you know, I mean, I've always believed in a way in, in going beyond the silos, you know, and uh, so for me, it was a great opportunity when in Venice, we could bring together the architecture class and the art class, you know, my art class, and Stefano Boeri's architecture class, and they could form teams, you know, bridges between art and architecture. Uh, it's quite rare that one can do this actually in existing universities. Very often, you know, it's these separated departments. So I do think that we, it's always been my unrealized project also based on this seminar we did in Venice to actually kind of start a new school. When people ask me, you know, I always ask artists about their unrealized project. When people ask me about my unrealized project, I really want to do one day a school, which is a bit like, you know, after the war, after the Second World War, there was this amazing Black Mountain College in the United States where John Cage was and Buckminster Fuller was teaching there. And you had scientists, you know, and the students included Cy Twombly and Robert Rauschenberg and Susan Weil and Dorothea Rockburn. You know, it formed a whole generation of um, of artists, you know, after the Second World War. Joseph Albers was teaching there. And this was a small, you know, college, but it was very interdisciplinary. And you didn't have this division. On the one hand, the humanities and the arts, and on the other hand, science and technology, you know. And I think that's what we need today. We need a new Black Mountain College. We need a new... We need new schools, which in a way break down the silos. And I, uh, my project actually is to do such a school, to, to kind of invent it or start it. That's kind of probably my biggest unrealized project, which I want to do certainly, you know, at some point during my lifetime. And so that, of course, you know, a school or teaching is a form of mentoring. But then there is also, I mean, you know, Bryce Martin just passed away. And he always said in interviews, he learned so much when he was studio assistant to Robert Rauschenberg. And I think it's the same for curators, you know, I think this idea of learning on the job. I mean, I learned so much on the job when I was in my 20s from, you know, the amazing legendary curators from who, for whom I worked, you know, Suzanne Paget, the French director and Caspar Koenig, they, they became kind of my mentors. After the artists, they became my mentors to really learn the profession. And I would say, you know, I hope that research assistants and, you know, who work with me, uh, that there is a form of mentorship there as well, you know, so kind of that's the other way. I mean, it's the possibility to teach and there's the possibility also to transmit through collaboration, you know, and I always think it goes both ways. I mean, I think, you know, obviously teaching is about transmitting, but it's also about learning. You know, I believe in this idea that we are lifelong students, you know, and we always, I always want to learn. And I always remember, you know, we've just had this show at the, at the Serpentine of the Argentinian artist Thomas Saraceno, and it was an exhibition about the environment and interspecies dialogue. Thomas brought spiders to the gallery, 
as architects, the spiders started to build pavilions. So we had the pavilion for human visitors outside by Lina Gottme, but we also had inside the gallery spider pavilions by Thomas Saraceno. He also brought in a confessional where you could actually uh, confess not to a priest, but to a spider. Uh, there was a spider oracle where you could ask the spider questions, you know, and many, many other animals, habitats, you know, it was a, uh, an, an amazing experiment. And I remember, you know, the same Thomas Sarazeno, who is now this very well-known artist whom we exhibited more than 20 years ago, was my student in Venice, right? The very first time I, you know, did a seminar, it was this amazing student called Thomas Sarazeno who arrived from Buenos Aires the same week, you know, and joined my class. And it was completely amazing because I immediately, of course, also learned a lot from him, you know? So I think it's always also about reciprocity. It's not the sort of unilateral transmission of knowledge, you know, and Thomas told us about the amazing Argentinian avant-garde, the Madi movement, you know, with Kozice who made flying objects, utopias. And, uh, you know, and I transmitted him um, also uh, a lot of, of course, hopefully knowledge on art and architecture. But then this amazing thing happened that about two weeks into the seminar, Thomas said, I really have to meet the mayor, you know. I have an idea for the mayor of Venice. Venice should work differently. So I arranged a meeting for him with the mayor and uh, he could go and see the mayor. So that's also a form of, you know, you open doors for for a young generation. I always thought that that's really, really important, you know, and I, when I was young, you know, when I p began, you know, I had so many people who opened doors for me and I always thought, you know, one day when I'm going to be in a position to do that, I want to do it. And that's what I try to do every day is to, you know, to open doors for young artists and, and young curators. You were talking about creating a new school, which for me is fascinating. I think this is such a phenomenal idea, but I'm curious why those schools that already have that format in place won't change their academics to meet those requirements to have something new and different instead of starting a brand new one. What do you think it's holding them back? I think we, knew, we need new formats, you know, and when, when I grew up, I mean, basically in Switzerland, as I told you, I started to make a lot of, you know, studio visits and then i received the grant from the um from the cartier foundation when i was i had just done my kitchen show you know so it's very my sort of whole approach was always very diy you know i wasn't waiting to be invited to do a museum show anyway nobody would have given me a museum you know at 22 <laughs> and so i just did it in my kitchen and i spread the word i said you know i've got a kitchen show and i invited well-known artists like fish Weiss or Frédéric or, you know, Christian Boltanski and others to exhibit in my kitchen. And actually Hans-Peter Fellmann, uh, who just passed away, the legendary, you know, German artist, he said, I want to exhibit in the fridge. I don't want to exhibit in the kitchen. So he did a fridge exhibition, you know. And the show had a budget of, I think, about $300, the whole show. And, uh, you know, so I could pay that from as a student from I did some jobs and, I, you know, uh, side jobs besides the studies and I financed this show, you know. And uh, and then became a rumor. And based on that show, I was invited to the Gartier Foundation in Paris. And, you know, through that, I then got a museum job at the Musée d'Art Moderne from Suzanne Page, my museum mentors, as to say. So it suddenly everything kind of opened, you know, but it was a sort of very much a DIY approach. And what was interesting was that I started to meet young artists of my own generation in Paris in their 20s. You know, the first one was Dominique gonzalez Ferstow. And um, I, you know, I also met of, soon after Philippe Pareno. I met also um, Absalon, who was actually my neighbor, the late uh, uh, sculptor who started, you know, he built this utopia that he would live in these different cells and houses, you know, it was like an artist architect. And then also the whole Chinese avant-garde was in Paris, like a big part of the Chinese avant-garde had moved to Paris, you know, in the early 90s. So Huang Yongping was there and Yan Pei Ming and Jen Sen. Uh, and what they all had in common, that most of them went to this institute and they all were sort of, they came out from the same small school. So I wanted to find out what that school is, you know, and it basically was a room, not much bigger than a living room, you know, where um, basically the 20, 30 students would meet once a week and have a whole day seminar. And the rest of the week, they were postgraduate students, they would work on their own work in the studios. And uh, the school was basically run by Pontus Hulten, who was the most, you know, we can say, networked and correct, uh, kind of connected curator of his generation. Daniel Buren, very internationally working artist, globally working artist of the 60s generation. Sarkis, the same generation, but actually from Istanbul, also based in Paris. So, you know, it also was a 
very, it was a focus already early on, not only Western art, but art from all over the world. So they had students, it was truly global, you know, uh, students from many different continents. And what was interesting was that they were just basically introducing the students to great artists. So every week they had another great artist come to class, you know, and many of these artists would not necessarily want to teach or wouldn't have the time to teach, but they would agree to spend the day with this group. So in a way, this was really transformative for, you know, and again, like with the Black Mountain College, it was it, it was a different kind of experiment, you know, and, and I, I, yeah, I agree with you. It's very strange that there are not more such examples that, you know, everything sort of follows off in the same rules of the game, you know, and I think we need new schools, which have in a way give access to a younger generation, to this mm -hmm. mentorship we've been discussing. And, uh, uh, and for me, these two models, you know, the Black Mountain College and then this institute of Buren Sarkis Fosch, who was an art historian and Buren, I've always sort of thinking one should make a, a sort of a new version of that. And of course, connected to the digital age. What is particularly important today is that, you know, I think if you look at how artists work and how creatives work, there is really a, a fluidity in the practice uh, between the disciplines, you know, poets are also into music, you know, composers are also making visual arts. Very often people make contributions to different fields, you know, and that's not completely new. You know, you've had that with surrealism, you know, Leonora Carrington was an amazing novelist and writer. I met her in Mexico City and, and she was also an amazing visual artist. And she said, I cannot tell you what is more important. I'm as much a novelist and a poet as I am a visual artist. So it's not completely new, but it's much stronger now. You have a lot of artists who in this very, you know, um, uh, in this very open way work between the disciplines, whilst our institutions are still very much siloed often. You know, you have institutions for cinema, you have institutions for art, for visual art, for architecture, for science, you know. And I can give you another example because it's true not only for schools, but it's also true for exhibition making, which is, you know, my main profession. It's to make exhibitions. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an exhibition maker in that sense. And for the exhibition making, you know, very often I bring in also practitioners from outside the contemporary art world. So to give you an example, about 20 years ago, we did a show called Utopia Station with uh, two friends, Rick Ritiravani, the artist, and Molly Nesbitt, the art historian. And it was an exhibition addressing, you know, the topic of utopia, but not in a sort of a static way, but in a, Edouard Glissant described utopia as a tremblement, as something dynamic, you know, not Thomas More, uh, you know, a different kind of utopia. And uh, it was really interesting because we invited people from different fields. And among the artists we invited was the filmmaker Agnes Varda. The legendary Agnes Varda, you know, who won an Oscar and she famously did this film with JR towards the end of her life and, you know, um, had a very long life. She, you know, lived for 90 years uh, and she won almost every award for cinema you can imagine. He's, of course, considered to be the model in a way of the of the new wave, of the Nouvelle Vague, no, of, of cinema. And so important for young artists now, the way she worked between documentary, you know, and fiction. So... I rang up Anis Vada and, you know, artist friends connected us. And uh, I went to her house and, and said, you know, we're doing this art biennial project called Utopia Station and we would love to invite you. And she says, you know, this is really interesting because my entire life I was always invited to film festivals because that's what the a film director is invited to, you know, Cannes, Venice, all the big film festivals in the world. And she says, these film festivals were always prescriptive. I think that's the word in English. There was a prescriptiveness in it, you know. You either make a feature film, it's got to be about 90 minutes, or you make a court-métrage, a short film, as she said, you know, and then it can be shorter. But she says, I have all these other ideas, you know, and I said, Anis, that's exactly why we invite you, because we want you to explore these other ideas. And she says, you know, I've been waiting for this phone call my entire life. I want to be free, you know. And so we invited her to Venice, and she arrived, you know, for the first time outside these confinements of the film world, she arrived at the Art Biennale, at the Contemporary Art Biennale in our space, and she installed a multi-screen environment. With a, it was a film about food, you know, it was a film about potatoes, um, to celebrate potatoes. It was also a film protesting against the waste of food, you know, because of all these systems of supermarkets, you know, so many, so much food gets wasted. And she wanted to connect again in a very sort of, haptic physical way to the potato as a very precious thing and so she brought in 500 kilograms of potatoes 
and she projected, you know, among the many different screens. So something she could never do in the cinema because in the cinema you have one screen, you know, you sit and you watch one screen and here she could have multi-screen environments. So it could be non-linear. And then she arrived in this installation and she was disguised with a huge costume as a potato. So she arrived as a, a potato, you know, uh, the costume had the form of a potato and there was a sound coming out of it. And she says, you know, in a way you liberated me, you know, and I think that's really what I think is today so important, you know, is that we go beyond these silos, you know, here is the film world, here is the music world, here is science, here is architecture. And also if you look at the big challenges, you know, which we face in the 21st century, I mean, one of the biggest challenges we face is of course the climate emergency. And, you know, all the disciplines need to work together uh, in order to achieve that. We can't have that separation. You know, we need a communion, a coming together. And the poet Etel Arnan, another friend of mine, the, the Lebanese Paris-based poet Etel Arnan, same generation as Agnes Varda, she passed away in you know, her late 90s last year. You know, Etel Arnan always told me the world needs togetherness, not separation. The, law, the world needs love, not suspicion. And the world needs a common future, not isolation, you know, and that's, I think, what we need. We need to create situation where we can achieve, you know, this, uh, this togetherness. And, and that's, of course, also super important in relation to the environmental crisis, you know, because we need not a sort of a, a separation from the environment, but we need a communion with the environment. We can only solve this if there is a, a feeling of a communion with the environment. And I think, you know, art and artists can make a very major contribution to that. I agree with you 100%. Do you think sometimes those more avant-garde groups that you just mentioned, those schools that have succeeded to go over and beyond the silo, is because it's a small group of people? I wonder how you manage to scale that to an entire school, for example, right? It's one thing when you have a dozen of friends that get together and really explore those ideas and push forward and really go after. And then when you start, to see that, that group becomes 100 or 200 people. How do we manage that? Is that something that is a, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with those people doing workshops? It is virtual conversations via what we're doing right now or a combination of both? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting thought because we need to always think, of course, in all the work also right now, how we can scale it, no? And how we can be useful for many more people, no? And also in different geographies. And I think, I mean, as I told you, the, the school is my unrealized project, you know, so I haven't done it yet. So I can't speak out of experience, but I can give you an example for an exhibition where we did exactly that, what mm -hmm. you described. And I do think that in a quite analog way, it would also be possible to do that for a school, you know. So uh, in 1993, exactly 30 years ago, um, we started this exhibition called Do It, you know, back to this DIY thing, which is so central in my work. And I was having coffee with um, Christian Boltanski and Bertrand Lavier, Two legendary artists, you know, in a in a cafe in Paris, and they said, you know, we can't always travel to our exhibition, and very often, you know, we actually have to send instructions, you know, like recipes, and uh, how interesting it would be to do a big exhibition where every artist would give an instruction, like a musical score, and then it could be interpreted, you know, locally, in a very different way. And I had just started to read Edouard Glissant, the Martinican poet. And, uh, you know, for me, Edouard Glissant is really the most important writer for the 21st century as a, as a sort of a toolbox. And I still don't fully understand why it's not translated more because his books, you know, the novel Sartorius is about the people without the genealogy where everything grows out of relation, you know, but also his poems and his texts about, about ideas are just so incredibly inspiring. And, and Glissant, I mean, we live in a world of globalization, undeniably, and it's not the first time the world experiences globalization. You know, there was a form of globalization during the Roman Empire and so on. You know, there were many different forms of globalization, but this is a certainly a very extreme form of globalization, you know, fooled by technology. And Glissant early on understood these two forces which are at stake. On the one hand, we have the homogenized forces of globalization, you know, where everything risks to look the same, you know, where also... Uh, a lot of things disappear, you know. We have to, as a consequence, the environmental crisis, the extinction crisis, rather than the environmental crisis. Of course, I've mentioned, said, you know, we need to talk about the extinction crisis because species disappear. There's a mass extinction happening, the sixth mass extinction. But also languages disappear faster than ever before. And cultural phenomena, which is why I de dedicated my Instagram account to the celebration of handwriting, you know, because I don't want handwriting to disappear. And so 
Glisson said we have to homogenize forces of globalization and they lead to the disappearance of many things and we need to resist that. But he said also, and that was so premonitory because he said that early on, there is this counter reaction that we have new forms of nationalism, new forms of localism, new forms of lack of tolerance, you know, as a counter reaction to globalization. And that's what we can see all over the world right now as well, you know. And he said that is very, very dangerous. You know, for example, the non-acceptance of languages people don't understand. You know, like I read, I think last year, somebody, you know, was aggressed in the bus for speaking a language which wasn't the language of the place where that happened, you know. And, and that idea that we don't have tolerance for many different languages is all part of this counter-reaction to, you know, to globalization. And Glisson said that needs to be resisted as well. You know, we need tolerance, we need togetherness. So he said, you know, we need to resist both of these forces. And that's why he said, you know, mondialité, we need a global dialogue which is respectful of local differences, which is able to listen, right? And so when Boltanski and Lavier told me that, I thought this is a great opportunity to apply the ideas of Edouard Glissant for the first time, you know, and do an exhibition where we invite artists to, to write an instruction, a recipe for an installation or an artwork. And these can be locally interpreted without the artist or the curator traveling. So it's also fully sustainable. You know, it's carbon neutral. You don't have a transport. You don't have any travel. Local ingredients produce the artwork. And then it's either kept forever or after the exhibition, the ingredients can go back to the original context, right? So it's in that sense, fully sustainable. But also the idea was from the beginning that we would always have local artists interpret the instructions, but then also add their own instructions. They become artists as part of the show themselves. So for example, if the show, the, the, the second time the show happened was in Bangkok, you know, it happened in, in Europe and then it went to Bangkok. So then, you know, we invited artists from Thailand to participate. And these instructions have been part of the project ever since, you know, they then went to the US and they went then the project tour to, you know, toured a lot also in China. And since 1993, there hasn't been a single moment without a do it project happening somewhere, you know? So this project has happened 169 times. So we have given a kind of a participatory template in a way based on which these exhibitions can happen. But the very important thing is not, it's not imposed on the local context, but it listens. You know, I think this idea also that we need to learn to listen. We need to learn, listen to each other. We need to listen to different species. We need to listen to trees. We need to listen to earth. You know, all of that is really, really important. So the exhibition listens and then whatever it finds out becomes part of the exhibition. And so I think in a way, I mean, once I'm going to have, you know, the possibility to do this Black Mountain College type of school, I could imagine in a similar way that we could come up and, you know, and Jona Friedman did this. It's actually really interesting that the urbanist, Jona Friedman, he was a very interesting urbanist, same generation as Etel and this amazing generation, you know, he worked in the 50s and 60s with the United Nations, you know, and on he worked on templates, urbanistic templates, where basically, you know, um, uh, self-organized cities and buildings could pop up, built by locals interpreting his ideas and then also modifying them, you know. So it wouldn't be this idea that you have a homogenized curriculum everywhere, you know, but in every place, the curriculum would evolve in a way, you know. So I do think that that same idea could somehow work, but it's too early for me to go into details because, you know, the project hasn't started yet. But it's a great question. Thank you very much. No, I love the idea. And I think it is so needed because the beauty of this is as the exhibition example that you mentioned that travels around, it gives an opportunity to create a life, a life on its own. It becomes something else. It allowed every country, every people to contribute, put their voice. And when you see it, you will grow it will become something different than you even expected, beyond perhaps what we expected. And I think that's the, the interesting part of the curiosity, right? To see where that's, that can lead this idea, how it can flourish. And as you mentioned, each country, at each culture has different priorities, has different uh, uh, ways to treat people and how they see the world. And then we can talk about religions, we can talk about upbringings, there's so many aspects to that. But to take a, 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 a pull in a cultural level and a global, and a, in a global world, in such a diversity world like we're living in, it would be fascinating to have an institution or an organization as cool as you mentioned that allowed people to participate at that level. That you're not only learning, but you're also contributing. You're also teaching. You're also sharing. It's in incredibly powerful. No, I, I totally agree with you. And I think what would be interesting is that maybe, you know, 
it would also involve video games. You know, maybe the school is also a video game because I think it's really interesting how over the last couple of years I've observed that more and more artists are working with video games. And uh, uh, I've curated this exhibition, which is on at the moment in two cities. It's in Düsseldorf at the Julia Sosha collection. It's also in France at the Sartre Georges Pompidou in, uh, in Metz about artists developing their own video games. And it's, of course, fascinating that in 2023, for the first time, more than 3 billion people on the planet play video games. That's more than a third of the world population. And, um, and that makes a far more, you know, pastime niche activity into the biggest mass medium of our time. And it's bigger than the music and the film industry, you know, together today. And I've always been very interested in, in this idea of video games because I think there are several layers, you know, of course, initially artists, uh, actually, of course, you know, used the aesthetic of video games already in the seventies, eighties. You have Erica Beckman or you have, you know, um, I would say also, um, Peggy Abesh or Elaine Sturtevant, as a matter of fact, you know, who repeat or change or transform existing video games into something else. They also critique stereotypes of, you know, video games and so on. Uh, then you have artists who start to use these incredibly, incredibly popular games as a platform for their art, you know, like Ariana Grande or Travis Scott would make live concerts on, you know, on Fortnite. And that leads us to the Serpentine. We at the Serpentine, we have a tech department, which we've built up over the last couple of years. And for Bettina Korik, our CEO and myself, you know, it's really, really important that this technology, these new experiments of technology uh, and art and technology and science are really central in, the, you know, in the future of the Serpentine. So it's a really big department now. We have four curators, you know, who work with us on that. And the idea is also to build an infrastructure where we can actually build, you know, digital artworks with artists. And so, you know, last year we did this project with Fortnite and Cars, where we actually did exactly that. We brought the Serpentine into Fortnite and we had over two weeks, you know, more than 140 million people who, you know, came in contact with, um, with our project. But now, you know, a year later we have actually, and that's of course what's happening now, that more and more artists are developing their own games because the game engines are more available. And so we worked with Gabriel Massan, a Brazilian artist, mm -hmm. on a journey into the fantastical, you know, and thought-provoking world together with a whole amazing generation of Brazilian artists because, you know, games are also collaborative. And together with Tezos, you know, we built this, uh, this game which explores Black Brazilian experience, you know, as it also intersects with the impacts of colonialism. And as Gabriel Massan told us, you know, I want to create the experience of walking through possibilities and memories of life and narrative, a work that people can walk inside, you know? And what is so interesting is that in this game, which has also a strong, you know, environmental uh, agenda, in a way, you can see that also in the show in Dusseldorf and, and, and at the Pompidou, which I curated, you know, more and more artists are also doing mission-driven games, you know? Um, if it's, uh, uh, Lua, you know, Lual Mayan or the Institute for Queer Ecology, you know, these are all games... Um, which have a very important also social and political component, you know? And I think uh, that opens a whole horizon also where games can play an important role for education in the future. And of course, games are in that sense potentially a kind of a Gesamtkunstwerk because as, as Gabriel shows us, you know, Gabriel worked with composers, Gabriel worked with, um, you know, web developers, with graphic designers. Literature plays an important role. I mean, even if you take mainstream games like Elden Ring, you know, the same writer, the fantasy writer Martin, who also wrote Game of Thrones, you know, was the, the writer behind Elden Ring. And so the other day we were talking with Kelsey Lou, the musician and composers. And I said, Kelsey, you know, what's your unrealized project? And she says, much more than a movie soundtrack, I really dream of making the soundtrack for a video game, right? So you can imagine, and then you go back to the 20th century, you know, and then we go back to the beginnings. And in my, you know, recent autobiography, I also write about Yagilev. You know, I wrote about, because somebody who was really important for me at the beginning is the founder of the Ballet Russe, you know, Sergei Yagilev, who is buried in Venice. And, you know, Yagilev was initially like me, an art curator, but he wanted to bring the disciplines together through his work, which is similar to what I've always, you know, aimed at. And so he started the Ballet Russe. And through ballet, he brought together the greatest choreographers famously, you know, and dancers and of his time. But he also brought together visual artists like Picasso or Goncharova. She did like stage designs, you know, so did Picasso. At the same time, Stravinsky as a composer, you know, they famously did Rite of Spring or Coco Chanel, you know, who did the costumes. And I think in a similar way, you know, and so the Gesamtkunstwerk 
which is the German word for the total work of art, is of course a little bit of a problematic notion also because it was used a lot, you know, in relation to Wagner and this whole thing of Wagner's, you know, a little bit overpowering opera, operatic kind of Gesamtkunstwerk. And I don't believe in an overpowering Gesamtkunstwerk. I think artworks need to empower, they don't need to overpower, they need to empower the viewer. They need to give space to the viewer. You know, the viewer needs to be able to do, needs to be enabled and needs to be able to do at least 50% 50% of the of the work, you know? I think Duchamp said that. Duchamp says the viewer does 50% of the work. So it's it's in that sense, you know, not an overpowering Gesamtkunstwerk. It's something which, you know, because you play a video game, it's very participatory, right? But it brings together, you know, all the disciplines. And so for me, really, over the last couple of years, this has been an extremely exciting thing to see all these younger artists working with, with video games. And it goes also back to your point, you know, about it being alive. You said this very beautiful thing, you know, when, when I talked about before about do it, you know, you said like these projects are like alive, you know, so they're like living organisms. They evolve, you know, like, like, yeah, living organisms. There, there's a, a, a life in them. And I think that is something which is also true for these digital artworks, you know, because if it's, you know, live simulations or video games, these are works which can evolve over time. It's not like a movie. Once a movie is finished, you know, it's yeah. shown all over the world. And it's very rare that a movie is then edited again, you know. It usually only happens if something goes wrong. Whilst a video game, you know, you launch it. And once it's launched, it's not finished. You get the feedback. You let it evolve. And, you know, that opens also great possibilities for public art, you know. I think we need to think a lot about in the 21st century, again, about public art. I believe a lot in this idea that we need to go with art into society. We don't have to hide art behind the doors because otherwise it's not, you know, it's not reaching everyone. I think, yeah, we need museums where art is protected behind doors. But then we need to also do the other step. We need to go with the art to the people. And there are lots of possibilities, you know, it can be public art, you know, our serpentine pavilions are in the park, they have no doors, people can just walk in, it's free. At the same time, you know, sculptures we do in Kensington Gardens, uh, we just installed a, a Georg Baselitz sculpture today, which is an exhibition, which is going to start and this sculpture is going to be in the park and everybody who visits the park sees the sculpture. But of course, digital art opens also new horizons for public art, you know, we could have a big screen somewhere in a railway station. And, you know, are in a subway station and people who pass by every day wouldn't see every day the same artwork. Imagine it to be a live simulation. It will continue to evolve a bit like Ian Chang's live simulation do. And then every day when people go to work in the morning, they see another artwork. It has evolved. And then when they go on vacation after two weeks, it's totally different, you know. And, uh, and I think that's really a fascinating potential also for the future of public art that there is this idea. And you mentioned surprise before, which I also liked a lot. And, you know, I was the other day, I was with Ian Cheng, the artist sitting in front of one of his live animations. And he suddenly said, wow, I've never seen this. So he was surprised by his own work, you know. When when you talk to artists who are very much invested in the games, what are the main goals? Are they trying to find, because video games usually is the, the idea is to entertain, right? It's escapism, it's to get away from reality and you can merge in this world and you can be whatever you want to be that and, and, and entertain yourself. Is that the same point some of those artists are pursuing is in a way to get people to escape reality for a moment and enjoy themselves? I think there are many different ways, you know, how, and it's interesting what you said about, you know, your, your children, because that's also what's happening with the show in Metz, you know, at the Pompidou, the show in Düsseldorf, at the JSC, and also the show at the Serpentine of Gabriel Massan. We have a very, very young public, you know, and it's actually for the first time that the, the children bring the parents to the museum, because usually it's the other way around, you know, the parents tell the children, you know, we go to the museum, but in this instance, actually, and then they don't want to leave and it's, you know, and stay for a long time and play the game. Now, it's interesting. I think to answer your question, there are many different games. I mean, that, that's why we also did this survey called World Building because, and, and also a book now, which, which brings together, because I think there is such an incredible wide range of what artists are doing with video games right now. I mean, I already mentioned on the one hand, you have the mission driven games. You know, these are games which want to achieve something. They want to, address the environmental awareness, you know, uh, they want to create uh, also, um, you know, social reality, uh, social impact, you know, all of that. And uh, I would call those the mission driven games, right? And then, of course, you have games, which in a way, 
have more to do also with, you know, parallel realities, which sort of mean uh, what you described, you know, that all of a sudden we leave this reality and enter another reality. Um, and uh, then, of course, you have also games which sort of go more into the past. I mean, I think it's really, really interesting how also, which is why I think the connection to the school is interesting, you know, because quite a lot of video games have also got to do with time traveling, you know, and uh, and we all of a sudden can actually experience the world in previous incarnations. We can experience the work, the world in previous centuries or even millennia, you know, and it becomes almost like a history. And, and, and I do think that this a history class, you know, in a way, but a very different way of learning about history than through a book. Right. And so yeah. I do yeah. think that um, uh, we have these different temporalities, you know, some games take us into the future. Uh, they have to do with sci-fi also. And some games take us into the past. They take us into Greek or Roman or other antiquities, you know, or, or they take us into even further back. They take us back into the beginning, you know, they take, take us back millennia, you know, millennia, millennia. And they also take us back into many different cultures so that it becomes possible to learn, you know, about, about different histories, you know, because the knowledge of history is so partial, you know. So I think, you know, there is a huge diversity in, and it's interesting because, Anna Anthropy early on talked about this, you know, because it goes back to what I said about Glissant, that we obviously hopefully, you know, won't have this idea of a homogenized reality through video games, but that we have an incredible diversity, you know, that many different histories are told and many different futures are being told, you know, in a way. How wonderful would it be if we have the opportunity to travel to pass to the time, as you mentioned, go back in time and experience, or at least to find out what truly means being human being through technology. That would be a very interesting thing to see that happening. Hans, uh, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I, I know we can go deep on this rabbit hole for, for much, much, much more. But before I let it go, there's three questions I ask everybody who comes in over here. OK, so number one would be we wanted to recommend as a book something to read. Uh, we want you to recommend us uh, something to watch. Could be a TV show, could be a movie, could be uh, maybe a video game to check it out. And also, we would like to recommend a guest. Who should we have here in the podcast next? Yeah, thank you so much for these questions. Um, I would say in terms of books, I would recommend all the books by Edouard Glissant. Above all, you know, his novel Sartorius which is uh, my favorite book, you know, by him, but also Poetics of Relation, all his poems, everything you can find of Edouard Glissant. And I would also say all the books by Etel Adnan. Um, she's never written a bad line, as Mahmoud Darwish famously said, you know. And uh, Etel Adnan's Mount Tamalpa is, is a very beautiful book. Her book, uh, Sit Mary Rose, is the ultimate book on the Lebanese civil war and given the wars of our time, a very important book about the war, as a, the horrors of war as a form of extinction. You know, I think a very important book. So, yeah, Etel Adnan is the very hopeful book of uh, the Mount Tamal Pais, and then uh, the very tragic book, you know, of Sid Marie Rose. So these would be the books I would um, I would recommend. With video games, let me think. Yeah, either video games, I can. you said it can also be... A... It can be a TV show, could be a movie, something that you like and watched recently. Or whatever. Yeah, I think uh, all the video games by by Kojima would be would by my Hideo Kojima would by uh, would be my my recommendation. Oh yeah, let me think. And I mean, my favorite game of Kojima is Death Stranding. It's a 2019 you know, action game, which you know is a truly great artwork. You know, uh, following a cataclysmic event. You know, uh, and uh, I would say yeah, Death Stranding. Would be definitely, uh, would be definitely my my the video game I would recommend, and I think it makes sense, given the fact of what we've talked about, to recommend a video game. No. Yes, I agree. Uh, and then for the guest, yeah, no, I love that idea that I can recommend the guest. That's really sweet. <laughs> Let me think um, whom you should invite. I mean, I think who would be excellent guests for your podcast would be Holly Herndon and Matt Ryhurst. Okay. They are visionaries, you know, because the other topic you and I haven't discussed today, uh, which is so important, is, of course, AI, you know, and that's mm -hmm. the other thing. We are working a lot with at the Serpentine. You know, we're working on two exhibitions right now, one with Refik Anadol and the other one with Holly Herndon and Matt Ryhurst. And the reason why I wanted to recommend Holly Herndon and Matt Ryhurst is not only, you know, their focus on AI, and but also they have a really amazing podcast they run, an artist-run podcast 
called Interdependence, you know, which is one of my favorite podcasts. And I think there could be an interesting exchange between your podcast and their podcast. This is why I think Holly Herndon and Matt Ryhurst about AI would be fabulous. And then it will be quite complimentary to our chat about video games. Look at you connecting people, even, even if you're not even trying, right? You can't help yourself. <laughs> <laughs>